Hello, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here and returning to the show back from his infamous hunting trip that happens every year and we miss you for a week, which means you don't have to break down what happened against the Los Angeles Chargers. Jeremiah Searles, the Tuesday morning left guard. How are you, sir? Oh, it's good to be back. But without fail, Matthew, every time I leave, something ridiculous happens. Like, I think I was texting you. I, at one point, I got first like, so give me an update. You're like, oh, buddy, I don't... I don't have time to give you the update. We've traded for Cam Akers. Things are going off the rails. I'm like, we're 0-3. I was like, all right, I'll see you when I get back. Like, I'm just going to walk back down the hill here. I don't I don't need any more updates from the ailing Viking nation. But, hey, got one in the wind column, right? Just need that first one. You just need that first one. We were really close to being 0-4 because, guess what? We could always be the Bears. You could, you could always be the Bears. So, silver linings, we're not the Bears. We're 1-3 and, and back on the winning track. 13-3, and here we come. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the, you know, the <laughs> bears might draft number one and two, which could help them eventually, but you know, yeah. at least for today, you could say today they're not the bears. Um, but I want to throw this out there and I did a piece on this and I've been thinking about it. One and three, their win against Carolina was one of the least inspiring victories I've ever seen in my entire life. However, I think what you saw was some things that could carry over and be good in the future because Kirk Cousins might not play that bad again all season. I mean, it was just way off in that game. What we've seen from the majority of Kirk Cousins under Kevin O'Connell is much more comfort than that. I think he got rattled by that interception right off the bat, never really recovered, um, but still found a way you know, to win the game. And now goes to Kansas City here. You've got to get a win versus Kansas City or San Francisco to keep your season going. But Akers in the mix is good. The offensive line, we'll talk about a whole thing. But overall, Kirk is not being pressured anywhere as much as he was in the past. It's really just over the right guard in particular. And the defense had answers, including Harrison Smith at the line of scrimmage. Marcus Davenport was excellent. They had really been missing him. I think you can sort of squint and see where this is not a bad football team and actually could be stronger going into Kansas City than they were starting the season. Is that too much to talk about for a one and three team? No, I don't I don't think it is either. You know, I watched a lot of football this weekend. It was the first time I've got to just kind of sit on my couch and watch NFL football all day Sunday. And I watched all across the league and, and you're watching these teams that have no weapons on offense and just trying to find anything they can. And then you watch the Vikings team specifically on the offensive side. You're like, this team is stacked, right? Like, and that's not an under, that's not a, that's not something that's like, oh, Searles, you know what you're talking about? Like Jefferson, right? Hawkinson, Kirk's playing very well besides this game, right? KJ Osborne, Mario Addison. And now you add Cam Akers in the backfield and you're like, we should be winning a lot more football games than we're winning. And so I don't think it's a stretch at all to say they kind of found, they found a way to win, which is what this team was all about a year ago, right? They didn't look pretty all the time. It wasn't great, but they found a way to win. And that's a huge confidence booster for any club, college, high school, whatever, to scratch out a win and winning the NFL is the hardest thing to do to figure out how to do that and to figure out how to continue to move forward with that is really going to be what dictates how this year goes forward. And you talk about a big game coming up. You have to grow each and every week and how you prepare, how you approach things and how you go about creating a winning culture. And with the turnover that this roster did have last year of losing some really key pieces, I think this beginning part of the year, they were still trying to figure out how to do that, right? You lose Eric Kendricks, you lose some guys that were core staple guys of when, when poop hits the fan, who did you look to? You look to the guys that aren't there anymore. Now you look in the middle and it's a undrafted free agent rookie, right? So there's so many of those things that are behind the scenes going on that you know that the the talent will eventually take over on the field. It's just a matter of now plugging the holes that we missed out on last year that we are we missing this year that we don't have last year and finding ways to get back into what the routine and the rhythm of winning football games is. I'm pretty optimistic Moving forward, that this football team is not going to be a zero oh and eight or a one and eight or a two and seven type of football team. There's just too much talent on this squad. Also, uh, Mario Addison was a defensive lineman. It is Jordan Addison, however, is a Jordan promising Addison. young receiver. My brain, my brain's still getting back onto track. I apologize, Jordan Addison. <laughs> Golly, retraction. 
But if they did have Mario Addison playing wide receiver, uh, maybe we would think less highly of the group of weapons. That would be a very panicked situation. Listen, but I just heard Mario Edwards called names so called so many times last night watching the Giants game that it was just it was just brain. It just stuck in here because I just kept hearing over and over again: Reed Addison sack, Reed Addison sack. That remind me of the time that the Vikings sacked uh, Matthew Stafford 10 times in a game. I mean, it's mm. uh, that was ugly. But speaking of that, so every week, no matter what happens, there will be quarterback pressures. And with every single one that happens, and this is not me excusing the right guard and his performance this year, <laughs> that what I get in my Twitter feed is, this Vikings offensive line, fire Quasey, he's done nothing. What what are they doing and so forth? And then I pull up the numbers, Jeremiah, and I look, and Kirk Cousins is the seventh least pressured quarterback in the entire NFL. And I'm watching last night, and I was reminded of 2016, sorry, in a lot of ways with Daniel Jones and Sam Bradford, except for Bradford got rid of the ball to Kyle Rudolph, and Daniel Jones just got sacked a bunch of times. But there were two backup tackles. At You know, you're bringing in Jake Long, but at times it's like Andre Smith, you know, Matt Khalil. It was a struggle. And TJ Clemmings, of course. It was a struggle. And me. I just, I just tweeted out last night. I hope you guys realize how good Christian Darrisaw and Brian O'Neill are and how much of an impact that has that you never have to worry about Brian Burns. When we go into a game and we're breaking it down, we never talk about the other team's edge rusher unless it's like TJ Watt level good because of how good these guys are. And so, yes, there has been some issues and some of the pressures have turned into turnovers, which makes them way more noticeable. But this is the best offensive line I've covered for the Minnesota Vikings. And they might be a Dalton Reisner away from being pretty darn legit. I, I have to agree with you. You know, Ezra Cleveland, I thought, has looked much better um, watching the tape from the last two weeks. You know, obviously against the Chargers, it, it is what it is. But like he didn't look bad. You know, and we talk about it all the time. You don't have to be an elite guard. You have to just be a middle-of-the-pack guard when you have two elite tackles, right? Because if you know that your edges are set, take your three guys in the middle and just control the depth of the pocket a little bit, and Kirk is a pocket enough passer. He's going to be able to step up and deliver the ball on time. He's going to get to the right reads and do all those things. But I, you're, I'm with you. You can't sing enough praises about those two guys that's on the edge. And when you look across the league, what do all the great teams have? Championship tackles, right? You look at the really good teams, the the Eagles, right? Lane Johnson, Malilata. You know, you look at what the Chiefs had before they got rid of them when they won the Super Bowl last year, Andrew Wiley, Orlando Brown, right? Like, they all have very good tackles. Trent Williams over in, in San Fran. So when you're mentioning those names, Brian O'Neill and Christian Derensaw are right up there in top 10 tackles in the NFL. Right. And so when you have tackle talent like that, you have to throw the you throw the football the way you do because you're not scared of the strip sacks. Right. Not many strip sacks come from up the middle unless they're free runner blitzers. Right. Those are where the strip sacks come. But so often you see the DN turning on a short corner, raising that hand up and knocking the ball out. I don't think that's happened one time this year. Right. I don't think that when Darisaw and O'Neill are in, right? I'm saying when those two guys are playing, not when the backups are in. When those two guys are in I haven't seen some DN come screaming around the corner and you hear throw it as the tackles facing the quarterback, right? So no, this offensive line, as far as pass protection goes, has been very good this year compared to even last year. And they've taken steps forward. They need to get the run game figured out because I don't care if you are the best offensive line in football, if you are one dimensional, the defense is going to find a way to get home to you. That's just what they do. So if we can get the run game going again, the introduction of Cam Akers was big this week. Continue going with that. Yeah, Dalton Reisner steps in there. He gets up to speed. He's an immediate upgrade from Ed Egram. This offensive line, you're looking at top 10, top 12, somewhere in that range, which you can win a lot of football games with that big of an offensive line. Yeah, and I, when I look at the tackles, I kind of think of what Teron Armstead and Ryan Ramchek were like mm. for the Saints for so long protecting Drew Brees. And I also think that Ezra Cleveland has improved. And Austin Schlopman over the last two weeks has done a tremendous job. Now, of course, the uh, difference between facing Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis and Chargers uh, on the inside is pretty big. But, you know, I, I think that at least what you have here 
is an offensive line with a single weakness that you could try to cover up. And I asked Kevin O'Connell about this and he said, like, now you can have a running back give help on the interior, which is pretty unusual. I mean, normally you see the chipping where they're trying to give help to the defensive ends, but when you can Island, both of those guys, it's a big advantage. And I think that at times we've seen Kirk cousins take advantage of the high number of clean pockets, but at other times we have not So what's the answer here? I mean, because you mentioned Addison, you mentioned Osborne, neither one of them are off to a good start. And Hawkinson is averaging 8.1 yards per attempt, which is, or per uh, reception, not even per target, but per reception. That's like what you might expect from Alexander Madison, honestly. Like that yeah. is so dink and dunk. What is it that needs to happen here for it to come together consistently. And I guess at this point we have to ask, is that possible with Kirk cousins? Because everything is here, but is it a Kevin O'Connell issue? I got a question this week from somebody of like, is there a play calling, like maybe trying too hard sometimes, or like, what could it be that is keeping them? Because when I look at their, uh, you know, scoring percentage, expected points added, the metrics that kind of point us in the right direction, you're still talking about a middling offense. I think it's the turnovers. You know, I think that's the biggest thing is when we're turning the ball over, it's killing drives, right? It's killing gains. And through the first four weeks of the season, it's really plagued us. I mean, we drive right down the field, getting ready to go score. We got three points on the board already, and we throw a pick six, right? And then Kirk Cousins gets wasted on the sideline, right? And quarterbacks aren't used to getting hit like that, and I think that rattled him the rest of the game, right? He didn't look the same the rest of the game, right? And all I could think back to was the the quarterback show of like, oh, my ribs. Like, like that's all I could think of, of. Like, he's hurt. Like, he looked like he was not fully operating on all cylinders the rest of that time. So I think that plays a factor into it. I think the other pl- the factor I mentioned earlier was the run game, right? Like, the run game opens up the deep shot play action passes, right? When you're just going to drop back and pass every time, those DBs, they're not really getting caught with their eyes in the backfield because they don't have to worry about run fits. Right, So many of those big explosive passes we've used to seeing Kirk Cousins over the years have come off those play actions, those bootlegs, those ability to hold those linebackers for just a second so that Hawkinson can sneak behind them or it was Rudolph or whoever it is can sneak behind those linebackers. Now that eight yards is more looking like 14 or 15. right? And so I think a lot of that comes with just our inability to be able to run the football effectively. No one respects it. So when no one respects it, they're dropping back into coverage. The linebackers are getting deep. They're getting into their drops, and they're taking away the deep shot and giving us the underneath stuff and then rallying and tackling. So all that's going to come back to the ability to be effective on first and second down with the running backs. right? If you can be effective and then everything loosens back up because if you can be effective, especially early in the game, you start getting some run games, some big chunk plays early in the game, first quarter, second quarter, then everything starts to open up more in the second half. Haven't really seen that throughout the four weeks here with the Vikings of super effective on the ground, everyone's going, and then taking that shot over the top. It just hasn't been there. I don't think it's a play calling issue. I don't think it's no coordinator issue. I just think there's not a lot of complimentary football going on on offense. No, you're totally right. And they finally get the running game going against the Chargers to start the game, and they are plowing down the field, and then Hawkinson fumbles. And the same thing was starting to happen in a little bit Carolina, where, well, they did get a 45-yard penalty that helped, but they were running the football pretty effectively and then not continuing to keep drives going. The other thing that's happening, too, is that the opponents are staying on the field for 40 minutes a game. And so if you have three drives in the second half, It's hard to put up fantasy stats when you have three drives in the second half, or if you're down 21 to 10, as they were against the chargers. And that happens, like you said, via the turnover. The interesting thing for me is, uh, so they're 31st in turnover percentage. No one's surprised by that, but they were only 20th last year. So I think that there is some risk taking to O'Connell's style of offense that comes along with sort of the, the whack-a-mole game with Kirk cousins, where it's like, if you put the gas pedal down more, more mistakes happen. And I know they're not all his, there's been some weird fumbles, Justin Jefferson flinging the ball out of bounds against Philadelphia and so forth. But that's all, you know, you get sacks, you get interceptions, you get one offensive lineman beat and the quarterback does not move out of the pocket. And that's like the sort of, we've gone through this 
over and over again. And I feel like it's just going to be a staple of who they are, where they are either amazing and breathtaking on offense, or we go, what happened there? Um, but I think that the running game can even that out. And we've seen that a little bit more over the last two weeks. I also think that the reason that Ed Ingram is still playing is because he's run blocked very well the last two weeks. And even if there's mistakes in the passing, I, I think a, an offensive line coach might give more credence to that than I do. And that's always been Dalton Reisner's weakness. But do you have a theory? Because we, we were given the we're playing the best five. So I'm not really telling you why Dalton Reisner didn't play the other day. But what's your thought on that? I think Dalton Reisner plays this week because he was with the Broncos. He knows Chris Jones. He knows how to block Chris Jones. He's played him a lot. And they probably were – this was probably the game they circled. You know, I think right before I left for the hunting trip, I was like, it's really hard for a guy to just come in right away, know the lingo, know the checks, especially with the backup center, and just throw him in there and be like, hey, best of luck, have fun. Right, like you want to get this guy ramped up because also he hasn't been in training camp. He hasn't been in practice. Like It's not like this guy was traded and brought in from another team and he's battle-hardened. This dude hasn't played football since last January. So it, it's going to take him a few weeks to knock the rust off and get back into this playing speed and tempo. And I do think even if he does play, we're going to see some rust out of him because it's his first live bullets. But I think overall, you and I have talked about it, the glaring issue is the right guard. So you put him in there at right guard and say, hey, you know Chris Jones, and welcome back. Like, you're playing against one of the best, but we need you to step up and play big against Chris Jones. I think you see Dalton Reisner at right guard this week. Folks, we are going all in on prize picks this football season. Every week we are playing and testing out our skills here on Purple Insider to see if we could predict what numbers players will put up every Sunday. If you haven't heard of it, trust me, you're going to want to check it out. Prize picks is the easiest and best way to play daily fantasy. Instead of battling against thousands of other players and people who spend their entire lives doing fantasy, all you do is pick more or less on between two and six player stat projections. So say a quarterback's number is 250.5 yards, go more or less and bang, you are playing and you can pick from hundreds of players and numbers this football season. The cool thing is that it's quick and easy and does not cost an arm and a leg. You can turn $10 into 250 just like that. Again, the perfect way to fit it into a busy day, click, click, and you're playing. This isn't just something that I like. You're going to hear us doing every single week prize picks on the show on Purple Insider. So go to prizepicks.com slash purple and use the code purple for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash purple with the code purple. Daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, I need you to speak to how tough it could be for somebody to not have training camp and come back in because as we're investigating theories, that might be the best one for Dalton Reisner aside from maybe it's just that Ingram was so good in the run game the last couple of weeks. It seemed like O'Connell was pleased that there was a fire lit under them. I think it was because they played two defensive lines that are uninspiring, but you know, it could be a little a and a little B, but uh, I get tired watching training camp from the sideline. Just, you know, with my beautiful skin that I'm trying to protect in the shade. I imagine that there is where you are prepared for the 17 game season. So I, it would be understandable if Reisner was not ready to go out and play a full workload. Yeah. You know, I had an old line coach in Carolina, John Matsko, old grinder beat you up and he would always tell us like in the dog days of training camp like you're callousing your body men right like when you get beat up when you're in the weight room and you're ripping your hands open early on when you're first starting to lift and then eventually those things get calloused up and hard and you don't even realize they're there anymore he's like that's what you're doing to your body during training camp and he's very true right you you get so sore after the first week of pads like everything hurts, your neck, your back, your shoulders, your knees, because your body's like, what is happening, right? And then eventually that just becomes the norm. And so you talk about a guy that was literally on his couch watching football two weeks ago, and you bring him into a week's practice, which is nowhere near the physicality that a training camp practice is, maybe one day in pads, maybe. And even then you're not really banging, right? You stay up and you hear all the normal stuff it's going to take some time to get yourself into that callous shape. And I think probably asking him to go play 70 snaps, probably not ready for that, but I maybe rotate him in, but I do think you have to get him in this game. I think he starts, 
But I do think you might see a rotation of, hey, two series, one series Ed, or two and two, or one and one, or whatever it may be, just to start working to callous his body the way it needs to be. And then if he goes out and performs well, and it also is kind of an open competition, right? I mean, at that point, you're like, hey, both you guys are playing, so it's an even playing field now. May the best man win, and we're going to go with whoever's the best man. Rotational third down guard is uh, the new – that's new football, everybody. That's modern football. Uh, no longer is it scat backs. It's rotational guards. <laughs> but there was a point uh, on Sunday when – uh, the sack was allowed on, on cousins. Well, it wasn't a sack. It was a pick, but it was a, whatever it, it you know, and, uh, I, I thought, I don't even care if he knows the playbook. This, it can't be worse. It can't be worse than this. And Chris Jones, I don't know. Did you ever play against Chris Jones? He's a beast. No. He is an absolute beast. Like this guy is Derek Brown is a great player, but he's more of a like push the pocket guy, more of a Delvin Tomlinson. This dude is a like 15 sack type of if you let him, you know, destroy you, he's going to ruin your entire game plan. Yeah. And, you know, he's done it watching what the Chiefs do. They pick who they want him to rush against. It doesn't matter if it's the right tackle, the left tackle, the center, the guard like they are. They, he's like a he's like a follow corner, but he just picks his old lineman. Right, he's like, oh, third and eight, and right guard. Right, like I'm gonna line up over you. And the thing I like about the Chiefs do too is they don't get cute in their pressure packages because they don't have to. They know they can get pressure up the middle with Chris Jones, so they usually drop into coverage quite a bit instead of just lighting it off over and over and over again. And that's because you have a winning guy in Chris Jones. So I expect to see him lined up over Ed Ingram if he plays most of the game. Now you put Dalton Reisner in there. He's probably going to move around a little bit, maybe over Schlopman, maybe back, move him back over Ezra Cleveland. But he is the star around on the scouting report, the game wrecker, have to take care of him, chipping on the inside, whether that means you know, we slide to him and we have a tight end that chips on the D end as the tackle bumps in and then comes back out. Like You have to game plan around that guy, much like you would game plan around an Aaron Donald or a Grady Jarrett like a, a Jeffrey Simmons. He is that type of player that has the finish ability to finish at the top of the pocket with sacks and not just hits and hurries. Yeah. And so I just had to pull up his pro football reference page. Cause I was like, wait, I said 15 sacks. Did he really have 15 sacks? Oh yeah. Uh, he did. He really yep. had 15 yep. sacks. So that is a dangerous, dangerous man. And he has looked totally fine since he's come back. He has looked like the superstar that uh, we expected, even despite not having the training camp, but maybe a little bit different for a guy who could ramp up over the first couple of weeks. I think that's a major problem for them on the defensive side, though. Davenport does change the math here. You're not just going from an all respect to DJ Wan for making a couple of great plays the other day, but you're not just going from a decent rusher to a really good one. Like back in 2017, where it was B Rob, who is the backup for Everson Griffin. Well, that's two very good football players. One's better than the other, but I mean, they're both good. This is going from a bottom of the roster type player, borderline in the league type player to a guy who was drafted in the first round because he is, as like you like to call it, a werewolf type of looking dude. Mm -hmm. And his impact was felt right away. I mean, I agree with Kevin O'Connell that if Davenport is in there and this Chiefs offensive line is very human, I mean, they are, they are very beatable as we saw from the Jets. I don't think this is your so massively overmatched like you would have felt about the Chiefs in the past. No, not at all. I mean, you talk about... Um... Jawan Taylor, not Jawan. Uh, is it Jonathan Taylor, the right tackle? Jawan Taylor, right. yeah. Jonathan Juwan Taylor, Taylor is a little small for tackle. He's a running back. <laughs> Jawan Taylor, you know, the most penalized tackle in the league. You saw it time and time again. He holds like crazy, and he's very susceptible to the bull rush, you know, when he has to line up on sides, which they fixed after week one. You know, and Donovan Smith coming over from Tampa, also one of the most heavily penalized tackles in the league, gets very grabby. So you talk about turning those two guys loose on the edges. You have to pick which way you want to slide, right? Which way do you want to slide, Creed Humphrey? Which way are you going? You're going to Davenport? You're going to Daniil Hunter? Like, what are we doing here? And if we can win on first and second down, which I think why the Chiefs won that football game last week is because they got Isaiah Pacheco going, right? If we can win on first and second down and not allow Pacheco, Edwards, Alaire, and Jet to get chunk plays on the ground, we have a really good opportunity to get to Mahomes and affect him on the throwing lane. The thing that scares me a little bit about Mahomes though is what he did to the Jets with if you rush past him 
he can escape and move forward. And his three interior guys are very good. Very, very good. Right? You talk about um, Trey, Creed Humphrey, Joe Tooney, like three very solid interior guys. And that's where he always escapes is through the middle. Very rarely do you see Mahomes circle the defense outside and wide and take off on the edges. He knows his tackles are susceptible to issues of running around the edge. And so he's very good at feeling that presence, stepping up those three guys in the middle and then escaping out. So really important that Daniil and Davenport, as good as rushers they are, they have to be very disciplined rushers as well when playing a guy like Mahomes. I wanted to ask you about that jumping off sides thing and uh, the alignment and everything, because you watch games on a weekly basis. And now, of course, you start looking, you can't not see it. You could see it from the press box sometimes where, I mean, Lane Johnson does that crazy kick with his right leg. And you're like, that was way before the snap. I mean, I, I, sometimes, sometimes I, I think that was way, way before the snap. What, what, what do you, what's your feeling on that? And the alignment where it seemed like because it was on national TV, everyone saw it. And so they were like, oh yeah, he's like lined up as a slot receiver, but people started putting out other pictures of offensive lines and saying, I don't know, man, is this really like that unique? So what, what is, is this just like a classic case of football doesn't know what its rules are or is he doing something unique? It's weird because I feel like whenever I was playing, like I was constantly getting warned, right? Cause you do, you want to live right on that edge of like my headlines kind of breaking his belt line, right? You stick your neck out a little bit, but it seems like it's gotten more and more egregious over the years. And I don't know if it's just because it's one of those things that it is truly a judgment call, right? It's truly a guy standing on the sideline, looking in through multiple receivers, through a bunch formation, through whatever it is and going, is it? I can't really tell. Oh, whatever. We'll just let it go. You know, but O-line, we're trying to find ways to give ourselves an advantage because like I, like we talked about, the werewolves are getting freakier. They're getting faster. Like we got to find ways to get back off the ball more and more. And so I think we're really flirting on that line of legal, not legal. But if they don't call it, we're going to keep doing it. And so I think it's one of those things that I appreciate what those guys on the edges are doing because you have to try. Right, you have to try, and if you get called, and usually the the side judges are pretty good about giving you a warning, like, "Hey, seventy eight, scoot up." No, oh, got it, got it. You do it for three, four plays, and then you just start slowly inching yourself back a little bit more, right? And then they'll give you another warning later on. But it's it's interesting to see, it's interesting to watch, and I think it's becoming more of the norm. And until the refs start calling it on a consistent basis, you're going to see more and more guys keep doing it. Yeah, I mean, and that goes for it is incredibly hard in real time, not super epic slow motion, which sometimes I feel like people think the referees have in their brains, mm -hmm. um, but they are actually just people. So timing it out between when Lane Johnson does his kick or when the ball is actually snapped is extremely hard. So if you're a little bit savvy at it and you can time it out pretty good and you know the cadence and everything, you can jump. But what Jawan Taylor can't help is how often he holds. That That is mm -hmm. going to be, I think, a huge advantage in this game for the Vikings with Daniil Hunter going against him. And I don't know if they necessarily should be sending the house, though, against Patrick Mahomes. Because one thing they do have going for him, though, is there's no Tyree kill. And there isn't like a nice possession wide receiver like Juju Smith Schuster for him to work with. I think that these young receivers are not doing a great job for Patrick Mahomes, but he does have Travis Kelsey. And I feel like if you blitz them, those two are so much, you know, beating in the same heart that like he's going to find all the spaces the same way Keenan Allen did when you have these really brilliant players who know their quarterback so well. I think Brian Flores is going to have to change this one up a little bit. I also think historically, if you blitz Mahomes, he is like even better than when you don't blitz him, which is kind of weird. Guys, I know you might act tough and pretend that you don't care about how the skin on your face looks, but we all want to show up to those football parties and holiday get togethers looking good. That's where Caldera Lab comes in. Over 100,000 men trust Caldera Lab because of the way that an easy skincare routine turns 
into clearer skin. They get results. And hey, it makes a great gift as well. You're going to want to try out the regimen, which has three simple parts. The clean slate, which is a face wash that leaves you feeling refreshed. The base layer that moisturizes and hydrates your skin. And the good. This helps your skin look tighter and smoother. And dare I say, even a little bit younger with the reduction of wrinkles and fine lines. If you've looked in the mirror and thought, when did I start looking like this? Well, the trials have shown that 94% of men showed improvement in their appearance using Caldera Lab for just a few weeks. So just for you guys, use the code INSIDER at calderalab.com and get 20% off right now. That is 20% off at calderalab.com with the code INSIDER to make an unforgettable first impression and give the best gift this holiday season. Folks want to remind you to make Little Caesars the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, part of your game day. Order online during their pizza pizza pregame one hour before NFL games and get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, everyone scores with convenient delivery or their in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slides slices during the tastiest hour before kickoff yeah you roll the dice anytime you want to send pressure to Patrick Mahomes right you know he has the ability to find the holes in the zone find the weakness but to your point lately those haven't been the deep shot kill shots right it used to be you blitz Mahomes Ooh, someone's going deep and good luck keeping up with them there isn't that this year. It's been kind of death by a thousand paper cuts. That last drive that he had there was just six yards, four yards, three yards, six yards. Oh, time's up. Right? Like he has the ability to do both. And I don't think we're going to see Mahomes throw three interceptions again like he did against the Jets. You know, that's kind of like Kirk. That's probably going to be his worst game all year. Right? He's not going to do that two weeks in a row. The other guy, though, that really intrigued me in this last game was Gray, the other tight end. You know, he made some plays. He stretched the field. And so now you can't really focus all your energy on 87 because that other tight end's got some good speed, good good things with the ball in his hands, too. You really need to contain Mahomes in the pocket and get home with four. That's what you have to do. And you, you're not going to get home every time. You have to accept that. But you have to get home just enough to affect him like the Jets did this week where – it gets him off his spot. You're hitting his legs as he's falling. He's dinking it short or whatever it may be. Or you're dropping into coverage and just saying, hey, we know that he's going to be able to hold the ball for a little bit, but let's cover everything and hope one of these guys can get home and, and make a sack, whether it's three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, chasing him around like a crazy person, like we saw Quentin Williams doing, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah doing, all those guys. So, uh, yeah, don't blitz him. I don't. I, you can't blitz him. You, you just can't. I think the run blitzes will be good. You know, first and second down, creating if it's an obvious run situation like they like to do with that 12 personnel, get in there. Run blitzes are good. But if you get him in third and long, you got to just play coverage and hope to win up front. It's so interesting because, you know, you've seen him win every way, and that's why he's who he is because – if teams rush him, he'll get the ball out. He is incredibly cerebral about where the ball is supposed to go, and he will get it out fast. But if you cover, he will just find space, find space, find space, and then do something with it. And run was the thing that he did against the Jets, which we can see you know, in the Super Bowl last year. Also, even when he was hurt, he had that big run that turned into the penalty against Cincinnati. Like He's done it all with, with that. But I, I feel like if there's one way where he can be a little bit less than Superman, it is when there's like four guys or three guys rushing and he'll get a little bit anxious and just be like, OK, I think I can make the most godly throw ever. And let me just try to. And then it bounces off somebody's hands. And you get a pick like that does happen from time to time with him. So Brian Flores has to really I, I sort of go with what are we actually good at? which is probably blitzing. Like that's what he wants to do. That's the scheme they have versus maybe it's better to see if he grows impatient when I think he does when he's not on the same page with some of his wide receivers, like he was in the past. So I, I really am intrigued by this matchup. And suddenly I feel like what's going to be really important is the last two weeks, the opposing team has not run at all against the Vikings. In fact, three of the four games, the one game they gave up 260. So the run game element of this, I think becomes very important 
because if they can run, like you said, then they have answers for everything and it makes it so much more difficult. Yeah, and we're talking about going against one of the best offensive minds in the NFL and Andy Reid, right? Andy Reid is fantastic at looking at a defense on tape and saying, we're going to press on their weak point until they either fix it or they do something that gives us something else to do. So I would really expect the Chiefs to come out and say, all right, let's take a page out of the Eagles books and let's see if you guys can hold up against the run. We don't have the offensive line that the Eagles have, but our interior guys are really good. So let's pound it up there with Isaiah Pacheco running like a crackhead and seeing if he can just pound it over and over and over again and wear out your smaller linebacking core and see if we can open things up for Mahomes because you feel like you have to start blitzing to stop the run, right? That's what, in my mind, I think Andy Reid's going to do because of how good he is at exploiting those things. But, I mean, I'm not entirely sure because you have Mahomes, you want to cut him loose, let him do his thing, but the great offenses adapt and Andy Reid's as good as they come. So I want to ask you about the bigger picture here. Because, of course, this game is a huge swing game. If you pull off an upset against Kansas City, season's back on, playoffs, we're probably declaring this to be a pretty decent team. Maybe not Super Bowl contender, but like a decent team that can beat anybody and that could be better than Green Bay and so forth. Like, that'll be the state. If they lose, no matter how they lose, one and four is a big hill to climb. I think the Kirk Cousins trade stuff is sort of off the table. But what you missed at 0-3 was people's brains breaking. Like, in real time, watching the comment section when I, we go live and just watching people bust in half over, like, fire the general manager, re-sign Kirk because we have no defense, but at least our offense is good, trade Jefferson for three firsts. I mean, it got, it got dark. You were out in the mountains or something hunting billy goats, and it was getting weird weird over here but what is the what's the big picture for you about what what the start of the season kind of means toward the future of this franchise yeah nothing's really changed for me from what we talked about at the beginning of the year which was this is an extremely talented football team but it's got massive holes right like there's talent that is top tier talent but the problem is the role players are bottom tier talent and I hate saying that as a player that was a bottom tier talent guy. Like I was, I was a bottom, bottom third of the roster role player guy, but I wasn't a starter. And we have those guys that are starters on this team in, in the holes. So I don't think you can say the season is a wash. I still think I put the wins. I think I put it at eight, eight or nine. When we went back, I still think that's a very doable thing because of our offensive talent, but we're going to lose some big games. This is a game that's winnable, but you look at our schedule going down the stretch. There's no more. There's no more like, oh, that's probably the easy win, right? No win's easy in the NFL. It doesn't It doesn't change the fact that I still think this is probably an eight-win football team. Figure it out. Kirk Cousins on a one-year deal, competitive rebuild or whatever you want to call it. But I still think big picture is this team is what it is. It's had some unlucky breaks, but they're going to have some balls bounce their way as they come down the stretch here because they're just too talented not to win games. Yeah, the hard thing about looking at the schedule is you could absolutely talk me into a lot of wins, but then I would be like, they were one drive away from losing to Carolina. I mean, that's the thing. Like, yeah. so Vegas is terrible, and, you know, Denver, uh, not so much good on the defensive side for Denver, but any given Sunday with this team in particular, you can't write in W's, but you also can't write in L's when they play Kansas city. Mm -hmm. It's like they go to Carolina and I think, yeah, they could lose. And they come back home to Kansas city. Oh yeah, they could win. <laughs> like that's who they are. Exactly. Yeah. It's just, it's a complete crapshoot every week. And so much is dependent on how eight plays, right? Like Kirk, you got to be on your a game every week, right? We got, we got pretty lucky last week that Bryce young was over there and it wasn't Andy Dalton even, or CJ Stroud even, Right, Bryce Young played terribly, right? So if Kirk's not playing his A game, this team has no chance because we're going to have to score 30 points a game. That's just kind of where we're at. So I believe that's why you and I both sit here going, you could win or lose every single game based off of how our offense plays as long as our defense gets us at least one takeaway or doesn't give up uh, 260 yards on the ground and it keeps our offense off the field. That's what teams are going to do. Be like, well, this team's really talented on offense. Let's just sit them on the bench. How do we stop him? Keep Jefferson over there twiddling his thumbs instead of running to past our corners, right? That's what you got to do. And so each week's going to be such dependent on time of possession and how many chances do we get? How many red zone chances do we get? All those things go back and forth. This team is a true coin flip every single week. It really is. It's a true coin flip. They can lose to bad teams. They can beat really good teams. 
but the great teams are consistent. And I think that's where Minnesota is not looked at as a great team, a contender team, just based off of all the inconsistencies across the board. Yeah, and I think that that comes from exactly what you talked about, which is you have enough weaknesses that on any given Sunday can be uh, exploited. And, and and it's not hard to pick them out on the roster. And if you're Carolina, you can't exploit them. But if you're Kansas City, you probably can, uh, especially considering who your head coach is. Uh, and, and they also, it's in a way, it's not great the way they played against the Jets because they played badly against the Jets. So, you know, this week it's like, we better not do that again. Uh, you know, we better be uh, on point. But I just think that, you know, this game is kind of a fascinating one to set as a barometer to how should we talk about you for the rest of this year? You go to one and four, your playoff chances go to very, very little. I mean, it's on life support at that point, even going to Chicago, which you never know uh, what can happen in Chicago. No one knows that better than you actually of what can happen mm -hmm. in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then San Francisco comes in here and that's going to be a really tough one because that's an even better football team than Kansas City. So this game kind of is going to change how I feel about them the rest of the way. I assume that we're both going to pick the Chiefs to win this game because they won the Super Bowl last year. But how much like what would it take for me to get you to bet on the Vikings? So like, I know you're, you're not going to gamble on football, but like. What if I said, uh, you know, 10 to one, five to one, 40 to one, like, what's the, you know what I mean? Like what, what odds would you take? You know, I'm not, I'm not sold. Kansas City's going to win this game. You know, I think it's more 55, 45. You know, I think it really is based off of, we saw how human Kansas City could really be last week against Zach Wilson and the Jets. Now the Jets defense is much better up front than what the Vikings defense is, but Zach Wilson in that offense was also pretty anemic at times, and they still found a way to hung, hang around. So, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it's 55-45 Kansas City wins this game. I think they win this game based off the fact that they have the best quarterback in football going against a very poor pat, or very poor defense. But I think it's going to be closer. It's going to be a close game. It's going to be a hard-fought game, and I think it's going to come down to who can make a play in the fourth quarter, Kirk Cousins or Patrick Mahomes. You know, I think that at 0-3, I might have been like, stop it, just because they're 0-3, and then they win against Carolina, and I feel like I should still be saying stop it, but I'm not because of the way Kansas City has looked. In in yes. not just this game, but multiple games where it does not seem like there's that offensive flow, and at some point, and, and I know New England did this for years where you just keep getting rid of wide receivers, but at some point, you are down to the point where why, you don't have good wide receivers, and that matters like the Vikings defensive backs are still their one of their biggest weaknesses but how do you attack that with Sky Moore who's never really emerged uh Rice their rookie is the getting in on some short passing game but they don't have much for down the field outside of Valdez Scantling and again that's not a really impressive guy so it kind of comes down to Travis Kelsey and whether you could slow him down in the chemistry with Mahomes which is going to be tough and avoid the Chris Jones strip sack and then you've got a yes. shot. Like, it doesn't sound that crazy. So I agree with you that I would lean Kansas City, but I'm not going to go full, hey, they have no chance because they still have the talent to stay offensively with the Chiefs. 100%. That, that's where I'm at with it. I think offensively we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them uh, based off of the weapons we have, but it's just hard for me to bet against the Kansas City Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes. Like, it's just hard for me to say – a one in three Vikings team is going to beat the defending Super Bowl champions. And also just to circle back, I agree with you on not changing how I felt about them going into the season. I thought they would make the playoffs. That is not dead at the moment. I thought they would no. win 10. I'd probably move that to nine or eight, like where you're at, but I still think they're going to get on a roll and beat some teams and still be overall exactly what we thought they were going to be. And that also doesn't change how I feel about the future. Once again, watching Shadur Sanders and Caleb Williams and Drake may, and everybody, I don't know if Drake may played this week, but every like watching those quarterbacks, Quinn Ewers and being like, not changing my mind, not changing my mind. Yep. It's still, uh, yep. still feeling the same place, even if they had a bad draft in 2022 or whatever. Uh, love to see it. Hate to see it. Jeremiah. I I'm going to start. I love to see two out of the three top draft pick rookie quarterbacks looking super fun. And these guys look like they're just going to be great quarterbacks to watch and follow their careers, Richardson and Stroud, and love to see the draft Illuminati, the draft reporting 
I would even call it uh fraudulism um of hey did you know CJ Stroud didn't get whatever on his S69 test? You're like <laughs> that's a total misunderstanding of what that test even is, but sure, lap it up everybody. Anthony Richardson can't throw the football. Okay, apparently you didn't watch any of him play in college, but that's some good stuff right there. The NFL, not fooled. They took him number two and number four because they are great prospects and they're playing great. So congratulations to them. None of that BS got to the NFL teams and, uh, you know, they're playing good. And I'm, and I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah, my love to see it is Dan Campbell and the Detroit Lions. I love the way that they're playing football right now, the physicality. I love Jared Goff going on the Thursday night set afterwards and looking at Ryan Fitzpatrick going, I wasn't sure I was the poor man's anything after being called the poor man's Matt Ryan. Like that team's just got a moxie and a confidence to them right now that embodies their head coach. And they're playing at a really high level. I love the way that Dan Campbell approaches the media. I love the way that, that team approaches the every single week, physical, relying on their offensive line to get the job done and just finding ways to win each and every week, not putting so much on Jared Goff's shoulders of like, you have to lead us the way, playing to the strengths of that team, the O-line, the running game. I think it's a very well-coached team, and I just really love watching the Detroit Lions play football. I'm going to go hate to see it uh, Thursday night football this week, which is what Chicago and Washington hate to see that hate to see what I saw last night was Seattle and the New York giants. Uh, the New York giants are on national TV again next week. Look yeah. flex early NFL and flex <laughs> always. Okay. I mean, you need to start this at like week three, Aaron Rodgers gets hurt. Everybody flex. Like, I don't want to see any more of the New York Jets. Although, you know, look, shout out to Zach Wilson who played a good game. I mean, he really did. Uh, it's I've never seen before the other team being like, hey, Zach Wilson played a good game. So you guys need to remember that. Like, wow, how bad has somebody been in their career that the other team is saying, like, stop being so hard on him. But the national TV slate will get good with San Francisco and the Cowboys. So I love to see that. But the Thursday night, the Monday night, so far this year, it has not been a great run. Yeah, I agree. I think you should always have the ability to flex those games. Not as much the Thursday night. Thursday nights have to be said just because of what it is, but you should be able to flex Monday night football. Now, you, you should be able to flex that game and go through it. Uh, my hate to see it, and I'm probably along with 90% of other loving football watchers, I'm sick of hearing about Taylor Swift. I'm tired of it. I'm tired about hearing about it. I'm tired about watching Sunday night football or whenever the Chiefs are playing. And Isaiah Pacheco, Isaiah Pacheco has a beautiful touchdown run, and he looks great. He breaks tackles. The blocking scheme was great. And all we can see is Taylor in her stupid booth like, yeah, oh, like I can't stand it. Keep football, football. And then let's not be so transparent and cut directly to the Eras movie tour. Like, could we be more transparent on what we're trying to do here? And I had a buddy that was texting me. He's like, it's for the cause, right? No scandals. Like, we're not reading about guys doing bad things. Like, it's good for the image of football. The hell it is. I don't want to hear about it. I'm done with it. Everyone's done with it. Let's keep football about football we don't have to worry about what yin yang and taylor swift and blake lively and all those fun people are doing it's the same thing with the cu i'm tired of hearing about the cu guest list right like kevin garnett's in the house oh cool who cares let's just keep it about what's between the white lines and that's all i want to know maybe it's the football purist maybe it's the old man in me but i'm just sick of hearing about it so here's my thing uh i have no <laughs> issue with taylor swift whatsoever i went to her concert it was a really fun time I'm not a huge, I'm like not a huge, huge person of her music. You're My wife really Swifty. likes it. And the concert was cool as heck, man. Like a anybody could be the biggest hater, but you go the energy in the building, the show they put on, it's like Broadway. It's incredible. I respect her business acumen. And if we can ever turn purple insider into capital one purple insider or whatever, I mean, my God, this lady knows how to make a buck and she's maybe involving herself in the NFL further for that reason as well. Much respect. <laughs> Shout out to all great business people. I hope you all make money. It's been over the top of the broadcast. It's been <laughs> over the top in the, in the reporting. It's just been like way too much. Also, I welcome all Swifties to learn football and then stay with it. Like it's great. <laughs> really fun sport for those who hadn't watched before. Uh, but uh, the whole thing of, like you said, we have to cut to her every time we have to like be talking about her or whatever. 
I, I just don't need this. Did it, did you, were you ever in no. a locker room where a guy was dating a celebrity? I don't think so. I don't no. think so either. I don't no. remember anybody who was like yeah. dating anybody famous. But like, I mean, it's even gone to the point where like you change your Twitter header. Like, it's like, thanks for coming, Taylor. It's like, what are we talking about? Like, that has nothing to do with football. And yet we're just obsessed with this person. I don't know. I'm just an old man. I hate it. I think you can live in both worlds without being like F her or something crazy where you're getting like too angry. You're like, all right, it's just a pop singer. All right. But also be like, all right, NBC, please <laughs> play cool for once. Yeah. You know, so um, Collinsworth, put it in your pants. Like, golly, dude, I'm tired of it. A lot a lot of high-pitched squealing has been going on from football people, <laughs> and uh, it's a little weird. So anyway, well, we'll see if she shows up. Uh, I know of some uh, reporters who are going to have uh, their binoculars in tow to see, uh, <laughs> is she out there? Is she celebrating? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> we'll see. But uh, um, I love it. Anyway, I. I just always say, let's try, you know, try not to get angry at things unless you need to. So I try not to get mad at this, but mute button is, is happening at times. So anyway, well, thanks Jeremy for, for your time. And, uh, Hey, why don't you write a hit song if you don't like her so much? Huh? Yeah, she's got a lot of them. No, I'm just kidding. All right. She's, well, she's the problem. It's not me. Oh, she's there you the go. Problem. So, you know, you know, just, you know what? After they have the references on TV, just shake it off. Shake it off. That's what you need to do. <laughs> Goodbye. Let's let's do this in a week. All right. We'll see you. <laughs> see you next week.